you have your Bible, turn with us, if you would please, to Luke chapter 23. Luke's Gospel, chapter 23. We'll begin reading at verse 24 when we begin to read the Scripture together. We have just gone through that season of Christmas and the birth of our Lord and Savior. And we have celebrated the birth of Christ and we have acknowledged, <coughs> excuse me, acknowledged his gift to us was the greatest gift we could ever receive. Nothing could have been more blessed in this land than for God himself to conform himself to the womb of a woman and be born of humanity into this world. God came to you and I in that virgin-born son in Bethlehem that you and I today might know who Jesus is and who God is. What makes it so wonderful is that you look at Jesus and you see God. And seeing God, you and I know that God must be the most gracious, loving, kind, merciful God that could ever be, who would conform himself, who would leave all that he had in glory to come to this sin church world and die for you and I. And so today I want to take up that theme from the manger to the cross. I want us today to look at the cross of Jesus Christ and then God willing, next Sunday we'll move on to the third stage in all of this, to the resurrection and the power of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we read together this morning from the scripture and we take a look at Calvary, I'm going to ask you this morning as we read these verses together and as God speaks to your heart, if you find yourself standing on holy ground this morning and you're in the midst of holy things, while we read together, will you just find the Holy Spirit to speak to you and say, you're on holy ground, you need to stand, and if you can take your shoes off, take them off because you're on the holiest ground that your life will ever be. Listen to what he said beginning at verse 23. And Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they required, and he released unto them him that of sedition and murder was cast into prison, whom they had desired, but he delivered Jesus to their will. And as they led him away, they laid upon him, they laid upon one Simon of Serene coming out of the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. And there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus, turning unto them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in which they shall, they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear and the paps which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on, fall on us, and on the hills cover us. For if they do these things in the green tree, what shall be done in the dry? And there, and there were also two other malefactors led to, with him to, the, to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be the Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, crowning him, coming, coming to him and, stuff, and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the male factors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself in us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, send thou in the same condemnation? And we indeed justify, just, and we indeed justly, for we received the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when you cometh into your kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, unto thee I, say, shall thou, I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me 
in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. Father, for your word today, we give you thanks. Thank you for the privilege again today to stand in this holy place and hear those precious holy words given to us by the writer Luke to help us to see, to understand, to remember and be reminded of all the things that you suffered, Lord Jesus, on our behalf, that we today might know what it is to have been to Calvary in our own faith and in our own trust and found you to answer our life as you did the thief on the cross today. Thou shalt be with me. So, Father, as we look at these words together this morning, may our minds be clear. May our hearts be submissive, and may we be obedient to the Spirit that speaks and shares with us from your Word. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. morning. I want you to take a look with me this morning back to Calvary. And take a look at Calvary all in you. The place of curse and the place of blessing. Calvary is where the Son of Man at his worst and God is his best. Calvary is where the Lamb of God gave up his life for you and me. Calvary is where we see the awful depths of human sin and the tremendous heights of divine love. Calvary is where every man, woman, boy, and girl must come if he or she expects to be, expects to be saved. There is no other place but at the foot of Calvary we can plead the blood, and the remission of sin. Calvary is holy ground. So we really realize today that most of us in admiration and praise need to stand on our feet, lift our eyes in faith back to Calvary again, and take a real look at what God has really done for you and I. As we stand there today at the foot of the cross, what do we see? Whom do we see? Who do you see? What do you feel? What do you know? What is the message to your life today as you stop again to pause and look at Calvary? First of all, we see us three crosses that outline the sky. Jesus being the center cross as you see behind us today. And those that were on the right and the left. One who found it that place in time in his life that he too were in a holy place standing on holy ground before a holy savior and cried out to him in those moments lord remember me when you come into your kingdom and found god answer him like his life today thou shalt be with me in paradise is that the tremendous testimony of your life today is that the tremendous joy and excitement and glory that fills your soul today because you too have cried out to him, Lord, remember me, and heard Jesus answer you. Today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. On the other side was one who in scorn and rebellion refused to accept Jesus Christ and lifted up his eyes in hell. What a glorious, glorious thing it is today to know Jesus Christ and know that relationship with him. So we realize there were many others that were involved in this time of the crossing. But on the center cross, we see the greatest, best man who ever lived. He was more than man. He was God himself. There were others who there, Caiaphas, Pilate, Simon of Serene, Joseph of Arimathea, and the women. By those sides, on which side do you stand? On the side of redemption or on the side of rejection? Where is it today that your life really is when you today face the cross afresh? and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Are you those who stand 
and hear the words over again in your soul and life. Today, if Jesus were to come, today, if you were to die today, you shall be with me in paradise. Or would you hear the other word, depart from me? I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. So that's what Calvary is all about. And so I want us to take a few moments to think about some of the things that Calvary is really all about. Calvary is, first of all, about guilt. Calvary is about guilt. Who is given the place of prominence at Calvary? Why was Jesus the central character? Why was Jesus the central thing? Therefore, he must be the most guilty of all of those that are present. But the question was asked, what crime did he commit? They said he committed blasphemy, seditions against the government, treason. They paid to have all of these things testified to about Jesus. But we realize today that Christ knew no sin. It's proved by the witness of his friends and his enemies. He never confessed a fault. He never said no. No one, can, no one could convict him of sin. He was a continual miracle of a sinlessness and a sinless life. However, on our behalf, he was made sin for us. 1 Corinthians 5, 21. Made to be sin for us. Numbered among the transgressions, Isaiah said in 53. Upon him was laid the sin of the world. We cannot imagine all sin being piled upon one man and one individual, but Jesus took the sin of the whole world. But, he, but here he is, the greatest of all men, taking upon himself the sin and the guilt of you and I today and becoming a sacrifice for the sin of the world. See, that's what Calvary is all about, but even more. It's about guilt. It's about those who were guilty. It's about Jesus Christ who was said to be guilty but was without guilt, who was willing to pay the price for you and I. So Calvary, first of all, is Calvary about guilt. But Calvary goes further than that. Calvary is about compassion. The only guilty ones at the foot of the cross were you and I. The only ones guilty of sin were those who stood and watched, not him who was crucified. So we realize today that Calvary is about guilt, but Calvary is also about compassion. Take another look at the crowd at Calvary. Because you see the woman of name. Can you imagine in her life as she was going to the grave, the very one that belonged to her? And on that way to, to the graveyard, on that way to the place of death, she met Jesus. And Jesus, in the compassion and love of his heart, raised her son to life and sent mother and son back home, rejoicing in Jesus Christ. That's the compassion we see in Jesus Christ. That's the compassion that he demonstrated to you and I who were dead in trespasses and sin on our way to the grave without any hope, without any reality of anything beyond this life but eternal separation from God until we met the man called Jesus who died on Calvary, who stopped us from the death of sin and gave us life eternal in Jesus Christ. That's what Calvary is all about. It's about compassion, compassion. Perhaps you see Mary Magdalene, and we see Mary Magdalene was walking through the world under the spell of seven devils. Seven devils had possessed her life. I don't know how many of us today, when God met us, didn't have that many or more. But here was, seven devils was in her life until she met Jesus, the Christ of compassion. God cast out of her seven devils and sent her away well and holy in mind, body, and spirit. It's all about compassion. Aren't you glad Jesus came to meet us in every need of our life? Some of us more possessed with evil than we would like to talk about, but meeting Jesus Christ in his compassion, he stopped because of Calvary to give you and I the victory. Perhaps you see the blind man who was born blind 
And there he was always in darkness. And we say, what a pitiful sight, but what a glorious thing. Jesus stopped for the blind man and gave him sight. Hallelujah. I'm so glad today. Jesus found me blind by the blindness of sin, walking in darkness without any hope, but in his compassion he stopped. And because of Calvary, he said, Gary, you can have sight and sight eternal in Jesus Christ. Amen. Calvary is about guilt, but it's about compassion. Compassion. Oh, today, folks, that's the reason I say we're, we're standing or sitting on holy ground today. Holy ground, because it's only through Calvary that our guilt can be forgiven. It's only through Calvary that we have a God who shares with us in compassion and in love. Devil possessed, he's ready to forgive us. Blind, he's ready to make us see. Walking in crippled, he's ready to make us walk. And all the things that life needs to be whole only comes through the compassion of Jesus Christ. Calvary. Is about guilt. It's about compassion. Jesus always did the right thing. We see the greatest thing he ever did was dying for you and I, dying for humanity. His concern was always for others. What were his first words from the cross? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He prayed for all of his enemies. You know, I wonder how many times Jesus prayed for me at the Father's right hand when I was walking in sin and blindness in this world. You say, but you could always see. I could see with the physical eye, but I walked in the darkness of sin and disappointment. But yet Calvary says Jesus had compassion. He saw our guilt and he had compassion and he was willing to make the lame to walk, the blind to see, the dead to rise for whatever need of life. God has compassion upon us. So today you say, who loves me most? God does. Who has the greatest compassion for my life? Jesus does. How do you know? That's what Calvary's all about. That's what Calvary's all about. It's all about meeting our guilt. It's all about giving us the compassion we need in that guilt to know life and to know it more abundantly. But then we know Calvary so also is about derision. Listen, what were they saying? These are the words of scorn, contempt, insult, mockery, ridicule, and contemptuous laughter. Hear them. They said, Crucify him, crucify him, release unto, be, unto us Barabbas. Come down off the cross if you be the Son of God. They gambled for his clothing. When he asked for water, they gave him vinegar. Then the, the sun refused to shine. Then you say, Preacher, I would never have done that. But Jeremiah says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's what Calvary is all about. It's about scorn, insult, mock, and contempt of the Son of God. But yet God still manifests himself for you and I through Calvary. Calvary is also about a testimony. A testimony. This is the king of the Jews. This is the only crime Pilate could substantiate. Pilate could find no, no fault. He was Christ's questioner, but he could find no fault. Then there is a testimony of the Roman centurion who stood there that day and helped him nail him to the cross. He watched Jesus die, and he said, Certainly, this was a righteous man. Surely, he was innocent. Everything said Jesus was being crucified for you and I. There was no guilt in his life, no sin in his life, <coughs> nothing about him. All the, all the old fellow who climbed up on that and nailed him to the cross or laid him, whatever really happened. You hear all kinds of stories. Some say that Jesus was laid on the cross and nailed to it. Some say that Jesus was lifted by ropes up to the cross already in the ground and then nailed there. It doesn't make any difference 
which way it happened. Doesn't make any real. He was crucified, and the guy that drove the nails began to say, I want to tell you, Calvary's got a testimony, and the testimony is this Jesus who was nailed to the cross is innocent. There's nothing wrong about him. And the man with the hammer in his hand said, I find nothing about him except intimate innocence, purity, holiness. He must be the Son of God. He has to be him, for there's nothing we can find about his life that says anything but he is not guilty. The testimony of the one not guilty dying for you and I who are guilty. Dying for you and I who are guilty. See, there was Judas, the one of the twelve. You remember old Judas, don't you? He was a treasure who was a God exposed in the upper room. The one who betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. And then here are the testimony of old Judas. I have betrayed innocent blood. I have betrayed him who is a sinless son of God. I have betrayed him who had no fault in his life. I have betrayed him who was willing to die for me. I betrayed him who all the time through all of his life was saying to me as Judas, I'm here, Judas, to meet the needs of your life, to share in your life, to help you in your life. And he said all Jesus wanted to do was to be that Savior, to die for me, that I might know eternal life. But I didn't see that, didn't know that, but I know this. I have betrayed innocent blood. He's not guilty. I betrayed an innocent man. Here is testimony enough if we have to, to win the world to Christ, if we'll just listen. Here is testimony enough for you and I today to know that we need to live that abundant life in Jesus Christ. Here is testimony enough to know that without Jesus, there's no help, no hope for us. Without Jesus, there's nowhere we can go. Without Jesus, there's no one we can depend upon. Without Jesus, there's no place we can find the adequate needs of our life. Without Jesus, there's no place. And without the crucified Christ, there is no hope for life. There is no. If Jesus had not been crucified at Calvary, you and I could have never known the answer to life. We would have never known the testimony that we've heard today from those who stood there, from those who saw him, for those who responded to him, for those who knew him, and for those who had all the things that, that they needed through Calvary to find the answer to their life. It's the only place you and I can find it. What is Calvary all about? It's about Jesus Christ. It's about him. It's about his life. It's about his love. It's about his giving of his life. It's about the shedding of his blood. It's about his love. It's about his grace. It's about his mercy. It's about one who loved us with a love beyond our imagination. Calvary is all about Jesus who can be all the the needs in our life. Jesus is the one. He's the answer Amen. to our life, to our hope, to our future. And without him, there is none. I'm glad today that he was born in Bethlehem. I'm glad the shepherds came to worship and to praise him. I'm glad that you and I know that in that cradle, Jesus came. But I'm glad he didn't stay in Bethlehem. I'm glad he didn't let the cradle be the rest of his life. But he said, from the cradle, I'm going to the cross. For only in the cradle is the answer of life born. Only at the Christ, only at Calvary is the answer to being reborn. Only in the cradle is a, is a, is a glorious time of God to taking man, coming in flesh and abiding among us. But at Calvary, it's a fleshly Jesus Christ giving his life that you and I might know what it is to be born by the Spirit of God. That's what Calvary's all about. I'm glad it's about you and me. It's about you and me. See, all Jesus came to do was to answer the questions for you and me. You say, well, I see Cal Calvary's about Jesus. Yes, it is. He went there, but Jesus went there. 
Calvary is about you and I. Jesus went there to answer mine and your questions. Jesus went there to answer the needs of mine and your life. Calvary is about you and me. You say, well, isn't it wonderful Jesus died? Yes, it was. But it makes more wonderful Jesus died for me, and he died for you. That blood that was shed was not shed because Jesus had to have his blood spilt for something he done. He had his blood spilt for what? Something to answer the problem of what you and I had already done, living in sin in our life. He is the answer. Calvary is all about Jesus and meeting mine in your need through his life. I'll tell you, that's the reason we get to look at Calvary. We ought to stand on the feet and holler glory. It's holy ground. It's holy ground. The holiest of ground because it's the only place that you and I in sin and shame can be made holy in the grace and the love and the mercy and the life of Jesus who died on Calvary. It's all about the testimony. It's all about the suffering. You see, he suffered in mind in your place. He's the penalty for our sin, your sin and my sin. It's nothing, is it nothing at all as we pass by Calvary? But the final thing is Calvary is about an invitation. It's about an invitation. It's about an invitation to you and me. In the final moments with his breath, last breath, he cried out to his heavenly father. It is finished. He meant that God's great work of redemption was now accomplished by him at Calvary. The price of redemption was now paid through the shedding of his blood. Men, women, boys and girls like you and I here this morning can have our sins washed away and it's the only place that we can have them washed away. Folks, without Calvary, there is no hope. Without Calvary, there is no salvation. I'm going to say it with all the boldness I can say it in the midst of this world who tries to deny it. Without the blood of Jesus Christ, there is no remission of sin. It is through the blood of Jesus Christ that we find salvation. It is through the blood of the Lamb of God, that Lamb that was sacrificed for you and I, that paid the price for us that we find redemption. This is the book, and it is a precious book, but you take the blood out of the book and you take the salvation out of the world. I know it's not popular today. You talk about a bloody gospel. Hallelujah. It is through the blood that the gospel of Jesus Christ can be preached, received, and known. By the shedding of blood, there is remission of sin, and there is no other way. There's no other way, folks, for you and I, but accept the invitation of Jesus Christ. And if we accept that invitation, we go nowhere but to the foot of the cross and plead the blood of the Lamb of God who was crucified there for the taking away of mine and your sin. Have you been to the foot of the cross and pleaded the blood that was shed of Jesus Christ? That's the only place to find remission. Jesus fulfilled his part. You and I can choose how we want to deal with him. We can either trust him or refuse him. We can either make it personal or not personal. But we realize it has to be our acceptance of the cross of Calvary, bowing at the foot of the cross, and pleading the blood of Jesus. Oh, Barabbas should have been reaching for those bloody feet. His word should have been, and your, and your life and mine should have been, by the blood of Jesus Christ, and only by the precious blood of Jesus Christ can I find the answer to my life. Folks, we need to pause again. We need to stop again. We need to come back to the place that we are not ashamed of that. And we are not ashamed to preach it, to profess it, to proclaim it, and to bow at the feet of him who was crucified there and say without the shedding of his blood there would be no remission of my sin. There would be no way to know that, that cleansing of my life. I'd have nothing without the cross. And Jesus was willing to pay the price for me. Am I willing today to live 
in that joy? Am I willing to pay the price with my life to glorify him who was willing to die for me? Am I willing to die that he might live in and through me? Am I as willing to die for him as he was for me? Because without that death of Jesus Christ, there'd be no hope for me. There'd be no life for me. There'd be no future for me. I can't today comprehend it, folks. If you ever really bowed at the foot of the cross and looked up into the eyes of that crucified Savior and realized every drop of that blood was dropped to the ground just for you to be the cleansing of your life, and it's only through that sacrifice that we have the salvation that God says we need for our life. We could ever walk a day, minister a day, or share a day that we didn't stop somewhere in that day and say, thank you, Lord Jesus, because only as you died for me can I live today. And sometimes we think, well, you know, he paid the price for me, so the price is paid. It doesn't make any difference. But it ought to make all the difference in the world in our life. He didn't have to pay the price for you. He could have called 10,000 angels to come and set him free. He could have stepped down off of that cross and say, the price is too great. The cost is too great. There's too much in this. I'm not going to do this. But he said, I'm willing to pay the price that you and I today might know the preciousness of pardon in Jesus. Tell you today, all to him I owe. Sin had left the crimson stain, but only Jesus could wash it white as snow. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Oh, hallelujah today, folks. That's what Calvary is all about. And that's what Calvary ought to mean to us. And if there's anything ought to make us walk in submission to Jesus Christ, but yet in the glory of who he is, telling the world by the blood of Jesus Christ, your sins can be washed away. It's through the blood of Jesus Christ that we find life eternal. Jesus came to die that I might have life and you might have life. World, let me tell you, life is in Jesus Christ and I have that life. I have that Jesus. Well, I want you to know it's all God said it would be and even more. I have more in him than I ever dreamed, Laurel. This is the answer. It's Calvary and Jesus Christ. Amen. Woo! Go! Hallelujah for Jesus Christ. Does he mean that much to you today? What does Calvary really mean to you? What does Calvary really, what does Calvary have on your life today? What is your life as you look at Calvary? Where are you when we talk about Calvary? You see, when you think of him, do you think of him of, of, of his wonderful gifts and the wonder of his life and the pledge to your life? What are you saying as you look at Calvary this morning? As you look at the crucified Christ, what are you saying? What is your life saying? What's your testimony? What is it? And what place does it have in your life? What does it mean to you right now as you look at that picture and you recognize that's not him in the place and the time it happened, but that's him in reality. But what is it really in my life? What does Calvary really mean to me? What purpose does it have in my life? What power does it have over my life? What is the answer? Is your answer this morning the old song that we sing? Love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my soul, my all. Will you let him be your life today if he's not? Will you today say, Lord, the only hope of me is that life and your life to be my life? If you're here today and say, I've been to Calvary, is it so amazing, so divine that it, that it challenged you in every aspect of your life? 
Is it so amazing that you say, God, such an amazing love, such an amazing thing demands my life, my soul, my all. It demands all of this. All of this belongs to him only because Calvary purchased it for my life. Is he more today than what your life more in your life today than many of the other things? Is his love so, is his love so amazing and so divine until you're willing to give him your life, your all, and all that you are? You say, but Jesus said he'd save me. All I had to do is ask for forgiveness of my sin. Yes, he did, but he said when Jesus Christ comes into your life, it's a total new world because it's a total new life that now dwells in your heart. What about your life? Where is Jesus at in your life today? In your life? Will you stand with us, please? With your head bowed and your eyes closed, I, don't want, you to, I want you to ask yourself that personal question today. Is that love so amazing and so divine that I've seen today? It demands my life, my soul, my all. God, have I really given you my life, my soul, my all? Does my all belong to you? And do I recognize that to such an extent that I'm not ashamed of you today? I'm not ashamed to praise you. I'm not ashamed to tell the world to whom I belong. I'm not ashamed to tell the world it's only the blood of Jesus Christ that can wash away sin. But it is so powerful, his blood, that it does wash away sin and we can be new creatures in Christ Jesus. And my life now, oh, I owe to him. He paid it all, all to him. I owe sin had left the crimson stain and only precious Jesus washed it white as snow. So he owns me today and I own him as my Lord and Master, my King. I own him and because I own him, he owns me. And his love so amazing and divine. I give him my soul, my will, my all. But maybe you're here today and you don't know that extent of Jesus Christ. And ask you personally, does God have your life today and you have his life? Have you given your life to him so that he can give his life to you? Do you know what it is today to be washed in the blood of the Lamb? Those sins being cleansed and you become white as snow? Do you know that love so amazing, so divine, until it says to you in your heart, yes, God, and it demands my life, my love, my all, and I graciously give it to you. I graciously give it to you. For I've stood on this holy ground in such amazement of what you've done, God, until I can do nothing less than give you my all, my all, my all. I with her heads bowed and her eyes closed. Where are you today? What does Calvary mean to you? Where is Calvary in your life today? What is Calvary all about to you this morning? What's Calvary all about to you, to your life, and to your living, and to your daily walk, and to your future, and to your hope, and to your joy, and to your peace? What is Calvary all about in your is it about those things that God has let us see this morning? Or have you said, Lord, I've acknowledged you, but I haven't received that life because that's not what my life's all about. God, the only way that I'll know real life is to know you and the gift of your life. With her heads bowed and her eyes closed, would you answer that question right now? not before me, but before the God who was crucified for you that you've seen on this screen this morning. What is Calvary all about in your life? Right now, what is Calvary all about in your life? What is it about? What is it about? With her heads bowed and her eyes closed, I'm going to ask Robbie, if he would just come to the piano. 
just play that old hymn, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left the crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Connie, would you come? Would you come? Just open that hymn book to that. Would you sing that for us today? And would you today say, Lord, you hadn't been, you hadn't meant to me all you need to me. Calvary hadn't had my life like it ought to have, but the Lord, today I want to give you that life. Maybe you're today and say, I've never been born again. I don't know that Jesus is a person and Savior, but I realize he paid the price just for me. And if I'll come today and reach out and take hold of him who died at Calvary, he'll share with me his life, abundant, holy, and pure, but I'll have to accept it. While she sings the first verse, what does it really mean to you today? What does it really mean? Maybe you say, Preacher, he, Calvary doesn't mean to me what it ought to. But Lord, I want it to. Thy strength in me is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me, that's Jesus talking to that all in all. Jesus paid. But Calvary washed it white as snow. His hand. One more verse. Do you find thy power and thine alone can change the leper's spots and melt the heart of stone? Father, we thank you this morning for again being able to just talk about such a wonderful, wonderful gift as the gift of your Son on Calvary's cross. Father, I realize today Jesus paid it all. And because of that, all to him I owe. For only that crimson stain of his blood could wash me white as snow. Father, I thank you today for the privilege of being one of those blood-washed children of God. But Father, I confess to you today so often I don't give you the recognition nor the praise nor the commitment that you're due. But Father, here today, as I thought about your birth and you brought me from the birthplace of Bethlehem to the new birthplace of Calvary, I want this morning to say again to you, thank you, Jesus, that you paid it all. God, I recommit this life to you because all of it I owe to you. God, will you take it and use it for your glory? Thank you for those who've been with us today. Thank you for the time of worship together. May your spirit go with us as we leave this place. May the challenge of Calvary not only be here in this moment of service, but may we take that challenge with us as we leave this place and as we live tomorrow and as we live the days to come. May that song remind us, Jesus paid it all and it's all to him I owe. For sin had left that crimson stain that only Jesus could wash white as snow. May we go out, Lord, rejoicing, but in that rejoicing in the commitment to live to your glory each day. In your name we pray. Amen. Good day.